listening to the Career Musician Podcast with creator and host, Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes, and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. My next guest is Sean Hurwitz, another fellow guitar slinging career musician and good buddy of mine. He has held down two massive gigs with Smash Mouth and Enrique Iglesias for long stints. Now, in the music business, we know it's not always easy to keep a gig for a long time, but Sean has done just that. And now he has started his own YouTube channel, Live Your Music Dreams by Sean Hurwitz. And he's got a ton of awesome content up there so go check it out and listen to everything he's got to tell us right here on this episode of the career musician podcast welcome to another episode of the career musician podcast today we are literally going to live our music dreams with sean hurwitz welcome sean yes that's what i'm talking about (laughs) thank you (laughs) yeah man dude so sean and i go way back um but you know something that you're doing right now and i'm just starting with it out of the gate because i think it's very very important that you're doing this you have a a youtube page and it's called live your music dreams and you're basically publishing new episodes on a weekly basis or uh yeah i guess you'd call them episodes right yeah it's weekly basis at least once we're, we're shooting for more right and you have an array of topics that you talk about but the whole concept is which i love education music education delivered in the modern edutainment type platform (laughs) right (laughs) yes sir so okay on top of that as you heard from the intro sean has played with smash mouth and enrique iglesias for some time you're basically a career musician guitar buddy of mine we go back at least a handful of years if not more we go back to 2011. I was at rehearsal and I went into, uh, what was that spot called? I forget. But you were working on, on a fractal unit. Right. And I was like, damn, this dude's, yeah, let's let's chat real quick, yeah, which is my right. MO. I love talking to people. So. Ah, and that's geez. it. We know each other since. That's right. Man, <laughs> forgive me. Okay, so it's been nine years. My goodness. Yeah, yeah. All right. So before we dig into all the meat and potatoes that I was just teasing with, Let's talk about your history. Where are you from and who was your mu- musical inspiration? How did the music bug bite you? Uh, man, I could talk about that for two hours, so make sure to stop <laughs> me when I'm, ta- when I'm rambling. Please, because okay. I'll do that. But uh, born and raised in Israel, um, Jerusalem, uh, born and raised to, uh, born to American parents. I've got three younger brothers. My parents were musicians well not for not as career musicians but they both had guitars in the house and when i was i want to say 11 i had asked my uh, parents to show me some chords uh very fast i learned that it's very painful to play guitar (laughs) and i stopped but then when i was 13 we got mtv in israel i'm watching uh black or white Michael Jackson, I'm watching Keep the Faith, Bon Jovi, I'm watching these cool guys walk down Jersey. Um, I'm just being exposed to some amazing stuff. And I, I'd always been into music through my parents, Eric Clapton and playing in a car, all these different things, um, all, all, all kinds of different. But I remember Eric Clapton, that, that's what pops up to me. But uh, uh, yeah, so uh, when I was 13, I took it a little more serious and I was like, okay, I want to be a rock star. And uh, I've, like yourself, self-taught. I mean, I went to a few, a few um, lessons here and there with teachers. Uh, my, my parents paid for it, thankfully. And, but really, it's more self-taught and just watching people and learning how to do what they do. Right. Uh, so 13 is really when the bug bit me. Um, That's awesome. I had a very yeah. similar experience. Only the bug that bit me was Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> oh, so. Dude. But you know what's crazy about that? I had the same thing, but but it wasn't Van Halen that people know here. It was right now. 
which was not Eddie. It wasn't um, what's oh, not David Lee Roth. Name? Sammy. Yes, it wasn't David Lee yeah. Roth. I when I first heard Van Halen, it was uh, the blonde dude. Yeah, Sammy Hagar. Yeah, yeah. Sammy Hagar. Thank you. So for me, that was Van Halen. I was ah. blown away. And then I came here, and everyone's talking about Panama, and I'm just like, huh, what? <laughs> wow. So when? So, what age did you come over to the United States? I came to the United States in 2003 when I was 23. And did you come directly to Los Angeles? I did, yeah. Um, wow. The, the, in, in my mind, it was I either go to New York where I have a lot of family mm. uh, or I go to L.A. And both of those places are meccas for musicians. But I did feel like New York was more, first of all, the climate there I wasn't really feeling it. I like the sun. And and the, the climate here in in uh, L.A. is very reminiscent of what I had back in Jerusalem. Um, but the other thing was I feel like I still to this day feel like New York is more of a professional musician's jazz guys. Mm. The, 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 you know, that's the Oznoi, like yeah. New York, East Coast. You know what I mean? Yes. Whereas me, I'm a rocker. Right. So I just felt like L.A. was the right place for me, and apparently it was. Being, being a career musician myself with all these years of experience like you, I think that's a very accurate assessment. Uh, right? Because yeah. oftentimes people will say, well, don't make those kinds of, you know, uh, uh, you know, what do you call uh, stereotypes, so to speak, yeah. or, or complace, you know, compartmentalize. But that is an accurate assessment. It seems like all the, the deep jazz heads or the classical heads are really – congregated in new york right yeah they are yeah, i yeah. mean they, they're really and it's amazing oh, the musicians are crazy. Yeah, yeah, insane yeah, yeah. i would yeah. not have stood a chance there with all due respect <laughs> to myself i had no way <laughs> i would not have stood a chance uh, it's funny yeah because I, I went through the same thing i was like new york because i'm from new york and i was like do i go back to new york or do i go to la but i came out here for film and tv music so and i know you do that as well so we'll get into that later yeah. All right. So from from Israel to <clears throat> Los Angeles, that's a big jump. How long did it take you to get acclimated and quote unquote get into the scene here? Well, I felt very at home from day one. Uh, I did change my name, not legally. My name is Shahar Hurwitz, and no one can say that mm. if you haven't been raised with a ch right. in your vocabulary. You can't <laughs> say that. So you come out with Shachar, Shakar. Shach, a million things. So Sean was the way to go. I, from day one, I was Sean. And um, I gave myself, I, I acclimated very fast, uh, but I got a job in Guitar Center. That was the main thing for me. Ah. So my first job, I looked for a month, hardcore. I mean, you, you're the kind of guy that knows this, When I, because this is kind of the, the way you work, your ammo. I got to LA with a I mean, I was like this, you know. Tunnel like, vision, focus. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, For yeah. day one, I landed That's 11 right. o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I, I knew one family, friends. I used to date their daughter back in Israel. Yeah. They, uh, I took the, the fly away. I got to their house and I took a shower, ate something, and it was like 1 o'clock. And I said, okay, I need, I need a car, I need a cell phone, I need a place to live, and I need a job. Where can I start? And they said, well, pick up a recycler. Uh, magazine down down that wasn't like the internet back yeah, then right yeah. they were just like you go down to the it's, it's five minutes away you just go yeah. down to the uh, uh, no they didn't say five minutes away they said it's right down the road <laughs> um, you just go to the gas station I walked for 35 minutes and then and that's one of the times I realized that right down the road in LA is not right down the road in Jerusalem <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So I went, picked up a recycler, started looking for all that stuff, and, and that's it. Like day one. So after. A, a month of looking for work, uh, Sam Ash didn't like me, and Guitar Center did, wow. which was which was a huge part of my um, it, it's a, a huge part of my development. I mean, it's why I am who I am today. So I got acclimated really fast, but I learned a lot of it. I got to give a lot of credit to Jason Crane, uh, who was the manager at the time at, mm -hmm. at 116 in Sherman Oaks Guitar Center, Sherman Oaks. And I really learned a lot from being there and them pushing you, go, be outgoing, talk to people. Mm -hmm. Don't just say, hey, you need strings, what kind? Say, you need strings, what are you playing? What kind of guitar? Oh, right. what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? What would you change? Like, start talking to people. For me, it was completely foreign. But I got used to it. Now was the hardest thing to acclimate to. 
as far as being a musician, I gave myself seven years until I was 30 or for whatever reason, if that wasn't enough, I gave myself 10 years. It felt like a round number. If it, w it wasn't working out by then, I was going to be a firefighter or something completely different. Uh, but in three and a half years, I was done. So I was full-time musician in three and a half years. So that worked out. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff we have to unpack there because <laughs> because somebody coming from another country, uh, you know, with aspirations like yours, similar to yours, or from another state even coming out here, um, needs to know this. When you said that Sam Ash didn't like you, does that mean that the interview didn't go well, or they just didn't call you back, or? That's a great question, you know, and I remember this, I don't think about this often, but I remember it vividly right now, they didn't like, and I get it now, I get it back then too, I just didn't know. They didn't like that I came to the interview, the second interview, with jeans, with blue jeans. Oh. Now, I didn't know that it was not professional to wear blue jeans to a work environment. In a music store, but... Yeah, you it, think, it's right? Music. But Come for whatever on, reason, rock yeah, and roll, I, baby. I, you know, <laughs> I got through. I, I got through the first interview, and then I came back to talk to the sales manager. And and I, how do I know this? Yeah. Because I they told me, "Thank you so much for coming. We're going to pass." I walked out, and then I said, "Now fuck this." I walked back in, and I was like, "I don't get it. What 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 just happened here?" Because I'm you. the right guy for this job. Good for you. And I that's reason I came back for another interview, and I'm perfect for this. What's what's going on? And they're like. The, the sales manager just didn't like the fact that you didn't look professional. I wasn't wearing a, a you know, a button down button shirt down. and I had blue jeans on. And I was like, I said, I'm not from here. If you give me a chance, that won't happen again. Right. But they didn't give me a chance and it was all for the best. <laughs> no, but, and the reason why I picked that to, to talk yeah. about is because it is important. What happens is as soon as your confidence is challenged, your self-confidence it's some, it can it can prove to be difficult to get over that and in the music business we have many many obstacles like this that are stacked yes, against us and that and look in my opinion that's the smallest of the smallest however when you're 23 and you experience that and it's yeah. your entry level position into the biz that can really be a big blow to your to your ego to your you know the whole thing yeah. So, Absolutely. so number one, it's important that you recognized it, and number two, it's it's even more important that you got over it, and you didn't oh, let dude, it stop you. You got to develop that thick skin, yes. and you know, yes, you know. So then you go to a guitar center, and they hire you, and there you really learned. It sounds like you really learned sales and marketing, and which is the number one trick of be outgoing, right, and sincere. I, well, I I learned how Americans, not just corporations in America, but I learned how Americans, at least in Los Angeles, yeah. how they work together, how society works here. Like yeah. you can just go up to someone who's playing guitar and have a conversation with them. <laughs> I, like no offense to I Israel, but in Israel, it's very like in Israel, you're walking around like this. You know, everyone's, what what does this guy want from me? What hey, I got stuff to do. It's almost like New York. It's really? like do me a favor. Do me a favor. I was just gonna say <laughs> buzz buzz off. I got I got stuff to do. You know, um, and and, and I in didn't New know York, that. And, and no offense to New Yorkers because uh, I love New York, me, but baby, come on. But no, no. <laughs> I, it, for me, it's I was just having this conversation the other day. I like when things, um, like you know. New Yorkers, as well as Israelis, they're not going to waste your time. Not interested. Thank you. Right. Uh, and that's it. Uh, but for me, it's like, I don't mind if you sugarcoat it a little. Just be a little nice about it. Mm. I remember, I'll give you an example. I was in, uh, I, I like to talk to a lot of people. I like to meet people all over the place. I was doing a gig in New York with a cover band. Uh, I was subbing for the guitarist and um, they knew that, you know, who I worked with, who I was, right? So they were super excited. Like, oh, this guy's playing in front of 80,000 people, and now he's playing with us in front of 200 people. I was like, yeah, sure, you know, I'm friends and everything's great. So they were excited. 20 minutes or 30 minutes before, they want to introduce me to the buyer. It's a couple, him and her, and the, the, the singer, this female singer, goes to the chick and she says, do you know who this guy is? Uh, you know who he plays with? And she's like, nah. And she's like, Enrique Iglesias. 
And she's like, oh. And I said, you like him? She's like, no. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. No, I, but the way she said no was with such disgust that it, now for a New Yorker she did exactly what you That's do. Normal. You don't even say, no. Yeah. Do do you do you like Enrique? Fuck no. Uh, Let's move on. But but to me it was like okay, uh, the conversation just ended. Uh, she could have said sugarcoated a little. She could have said, "Eh, he's not really my type, but I, you know, I respect what he does." And then we could have had a conversation. I would have said, you know what? Here's how I feel about it. But as soon as you just like, fuck no. Psh, okay, cool. I guess I guess we're done with this conversation. This could have been fun, but we'll never know. <laughs> Conversely, here in LA, everything's like the answer would have been, oh, that's cool, nice man. You know, yeah. and you just blow over it, even though you don't give a shit. You just blow right over it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't need her to like Enrique. I didn't need her to like. I, I, you know, I, I think I mentioned Pitbull because we had just gotten off the road with, gotten off the road with him. Yeah. And but, but it's like, yeah, I don't. It's cool that you don't like him, but you don't have to be such a, this. you know, <laughs> you know, so, just sugarcoat it a little, a little. So just, I didn't realize that Israelis were the same as New Yorkers. There is, there's a disdain, like innately in me. I have this disdain for everything. <laughs> Like, what's the matter with you? Nothing. I'm fine. What do you mean? What, me. Why? What the hell? What's? It's like all yeah. of a sudden, you ask me a question, I'm bothered that you asked me a question, and now I'm like, what do yeah. you want? It's like, what the, you know, and I have to work on that with my wife all the time. It's just like, you know, honey, why are you so upset? I'm not upset. I'm just, well, you sound upset. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> oh no, but it's like that. It, it, I, I tell people, yeah. I, yeah. I love Israelis, you know, it's where I'm from, it's my homeland, but... But I and, and this could be just my perspective. I'll put it out there. But for me, I tell people that in Israel, it's like you stop someone in the in the street and you just want to know what time it is. It's like, like I got time for this. Yeah. Jesus <laughs> fucking, Christ. it's tw it's two forty, man. Can I go now? But but in in you could do that. I feel like, and from my experience, I you could do that. that in L.A. and end up talking to the person for an hour. Because it's just, it's like that. It's just like, hey, what's the time? Yeah. Oh, it's 2.40. Wait, you, are you from here? No, I'm actually from so-and-so. Right. Well, what are you doing here? It could totally turn into that. Yeah. Not in Israel, from my experience, and not really in New York. But but New Yorkers appreciate, and you, you, you can uh, attest to this, New Yorkers appreciate the honesty. Just get, get to the point. Right. That's... Get to the point. Tell me right now, yes or no. That's all I want to know. Well, let me, let's talk about the flip side of this. And I know we went on a tangent, but this is a good tangent because this is one of my pet peeves in business. And I don't care if you're in the music business, the car sales business, the, the medical industry, whatever. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Here's Now, here's the thing in L.A. Oh, yeah, cool. Okay, great. You have this 15-minute conversation. Oh, let's do lunch. Okay, we'll exchange numbers. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And then you reach out to that person. You get crickets. <laughs> or, or you reach out to that person and they respond, oh, yeah, yeah, cool, 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 we'll set it up, we'll set it up. And then you reach out again to follow through and they ghost you. Or they just ghost you all together. I'm like, you know what? That's the issue. That's one of the many issues I have with the music business. Everybody's full of shit. Nobody does what they say they're going to do. And that is, obviously, I'm making large yeah, generalizations, <laughs> exaggerations, right? but you know what I mean. Yeah. The majority, it's like, hey, if you say you're going to do this, do this. And check it out. If I follow up with you yeah. via email or DM or text or whatever, have the decency to say, you know what? Thank you so much for reaching out. At this time, I can't do that, but let's stay in touch. Just yeah. respond. Yeah. You know what Absolutely, I mean? Absolutely, I agree. Yeah, you know, what, I, I, I agree 100%. The whether flip you're side asking is also for something or not, I don't care if I'm saying, hey, Sean, I know you're a big music supervisor. Will you please listen to my catalog and consider putting it in some of your shows? Even if you're not remotely interested, just say, oh, you know what? Thank you so much. I'm kind of slammed right now. I have all the info, all the product I need, you know, all the material I need. Stay in touch. You never know at a later date. That's all. And then I could be like, I, you, could, you close that loop for me. So now yeah. I know, okay, Sean, her, okay, I'll mark that down on my little database. I'll hit him up maybe in yeah. three months, you know? Follow-up. Follow-up is everything. Right? I have a list right now of follow-up that I need to do with a bunch of libraries. Yes. Because they answered me and said, we're not looking right now. Yes. Cool. I'll follow up with you in half a year. Versus if they ghost you, now you're thinking, not only, first of all, is it a huge hit on your ego once again and your, your self-confidence, right? Your self-image, mm -hmm. your whole, the whole thing. But then you're like, 
okay, I don't know what to think. I just, you know, you have no, there's no recourse. There's no reference point. You don't know, did right. they not like the music? Did they not like you? Right. Is it just not the right time? You don't know. Right. It's like if you would have never turned around and walked back into Sam Mash and yeah. said, hey, what is it? But see, then you got, you knew. And it wasn't like you, the satisfaction of knowing, but now you could correct that. Yes, absolutely. And, and we spoke before we started recording about learning from mistakes right. and, uh, and successes of our own and other people around us. That's the biggest tool you could have. So I was like, it's fine. You don't want me. I get it. I'm not going to fight you about it. Right. But tell me why. Be honest with me. What right. was it? And what I was know, my pants. I, okay. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I, and I know now in, in today's culture, ghosting is a thing, quote unquote, you know. Um, yeah. J- just don't do it because you know what? How would you feel if somebody ghosted you? Uh, somebody how, do, that, how do you how do you feel when they right. ghost you? Like it happens to everyone, es- so. especially when somebody that you really want to hear from. You know, it makes you feel pretty crappy. So don't do it to other people. Anyway, all right, that's my rant. That's our rant. We did it's, a good it's job. It's a good it's a good rant. It's <laughs> and and like you said, it, there's a sweet medium. The music supervisor didn't say no. Right. He didn't say he didn't ghost you. Ideally, what he says is. You got some good music. We're not interested right now. We're not looking for it, but please feel free to be in touch. That's that sugarcoating that I'm talking about yeah. that that Israelis, very generalizing, Israelis and New Yorkers right. are missing a little. Right. And But it, like you said, in LA, it's a flip side. They sugarcoat it so much that they won't tell you, I'm not interested. I appreciate mm-hmm. it, but I'm not interested. They'll just be like, yeah, let's get together for lunch and then never <laughs> answer your messages. And, so and, that's the flip and side. Li- I love how we're doing this geographically because I lived in Nashville for eight years. How is that? They're a mini LA. There's just a smaller version of LA. And I say mini because, you know, ge- yeah. it's smaller. It's a smaller uh, landscape, but it's the same concept. And they kill you with kindness, but then they don't follow up. So it's like, it's the ah. same thing. And again, these are audience, listening audience, please. These are large, huge generalizations that Sean and I are making. The, yes, you know, very, very. Yeah. You'll always find good people. You know, always, but, but, there's always, always there. good people. That's right. Because it always depends on the character of the person, right? And I got to tell you for your listeners that. I have found, although I am very aware of the of what you're talking about, I have found that it does. I haven't encountered that that much, and the reason is because you find groups of people. Yes, like I know it's little pockets. I notice I know so many musicians, but then I'll find one musician, and he or she are in a completely different group of amazingly talented musicians here in LA that I've never heard of. But right. they're awesome. So you get into these groups. You can get into the group, no offense to anyone that uses substances, but you can get into groups that are completely, um, that, that use substances all the time. Right. Then you can get into groups that don't at all. You can get into groups that are completely full of shit, or you can get into groups that will just give it to you the way it is. So it is kind of who you surround yourself with. It's true. It's true. That's absolutely right. All right. Okay, good. Well, we did a lot of uh, speculating there. A lot of rhetoric yeah. on our parts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was good. That's good. That's good. good. All right. Listen, so moving on from that. Um, look, you've done a lot of big world tours. Talk about. Let's talk about that. And let's start with getting the gig. Because I've done some, some big auditions out here in L.A., and I know you have. And we have a term called cattle call. Right, which just so, means it's a big giant line of people standing around the building usually, and it's kind of a cattle call waiting to to your till your number gets called to go in and do your thing, and typically it's for the music director. Sometimes the artist is there, uh, especially out here in L.A. There's usually always one or two cameras. You know, there might be wardrobe people there, there might be managers. There's a lot of different types of people there in addition mm-hmm. to the band. Talk about the audition and, and, and how you landed them, or, or maybe one or um, two auditions, or you know, just your. You experience. know, I actually mentioned this. Uh, you mentioned that I have a video, uh, a video, a YouTube channel. If you just look up Sean Hurwitz, right, uh, on YouTube, you'll find me. And one of the things that I spoke about recently was, um, I'm, I'm forgetting. You just what was the exact question? Oh, the, about the, the audition. audition process. Yeah, the audition. I, so yes, I've definitely done my cattle calls. But if we're talking about Smash Mouth and Enrique, I mentioned it in a video. It actually hasn't come out yet. But um, I mentioned that ninety 
percent of the gigs out there you get because you know someone and it's not you, it's not like it's not the way it sounds. It's not like, oh, you have to know someone to get the gig. But you sort of do. And the reason is because people want to play with people they like. Yeah. They want to play with people they know. If there was an opening for a rock guitar part, I know that Nomad would call me at least for the audition. I might not get it, but he would think, I dig that guy. We hike together. We work out together. We're friends. I want to play with him. Right. Oh, Rather, absolutely. Yeah, rather than just a cattle call. A cattle call might happen if that's what the artist wants. But if the artist says, hey, man, d do you have any guys you might think of for some rock guitar? They don't have to shred or anything. They just have to have a good persona on stage, need to be fun. You would think of me. I might not get the gig, but you would think of me. Oh, and absolutely. That's, and that's most gigs, how most gigs work. That's how I got the Smash Mouth gig. Right. That's how I got the Enrique gig. Go. That I can get into it, but that's the gist of no, it. No, it, that's perfect because you know I always talk about networking, and of course now in the middle of pandemic, networking is more difficult. But networking doesn't mean putting a name tag on your shirt and going to conventions and saying hi, I'm so and so. You know that's a very old fashioned concept of networking. Networking really is just about building relationships and cultivating relationships. Yes, one hundred percent. And and you find people that you have a lot of things in common with. So yes, that 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 is amazing, and that is true. So as you're embarking upon your music career you come out here or wherever you go just develop those relationships things will happen over time and don't be discouraged right if it takes a little bit of time right absolutely it, it will take time most likely right. and i can tell you the one add-on um piece of advice is that i would say don't do things because you want something from it don't mm -hmm. start talking don't be the person that just makes that connection with that person because you want to get into the avril lavigne band no do things for other people it will come back to you right you will it, it, it don't worry about it just be good help other people out don't do things just because you want something do things because you can help other people and trust me trust me trust me it will come back to you what goes around comes around that's right absolutely absolutely okay so once again it comes down to the character of a person and we all need to have a good character and and good mm -hmm. motivation you know, pure motivation. So yep. you get the gig like that through a friend. Have you ever done a cattle call audition? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And what was that experience like? Were you shaking in your boots? Were you cool? Were you confident? Well, you know, what was that all about? Uh, well, it depends on the gig. I mean, I've auditioned for many. Uh, Avril Lavigne and Daughtry are some of the bigger names that I've auditioned for that I didn't get the gig. Um, but... Um, I guess it was a little scary because you remember it was usually a Barry Squire gig. For those who don't yeah. know, Barry was uh, was I think it still is, but not for our age range. Right. You know, he's the guy that um, a band is looking for a, a sub guitarist or someone or a drummer or a, an artist is looking to put together a whole band. They call Barry. Barry has a roster of musicians. He picks the right ones and calls those people in uh, and arranges the whole thing. So those were Barry Squire auditions uh, for the most part. And uh, I, so, so you get three songs the day before, right. two, three songs that you have to learn, average. Uh, and it's usually kind of scary because you are going, this is a big opportunity, dude. Right, right, right. You're right, going right. to audition, but then you get there and you're nobody, bro. <laughs> you're nobody. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's how I felt. You asked how I felt. That's, that's right. how I, you, no, I you're just nobody. I appreciate that truth, because that, that candor. For me, I was I was always in the Ricky Minor camp. So Ricky Minor was the other music director, again, in our yeah. age group, that was putting bands together. So for some reason, I did a ton of Ricky auditions. I never got even called for a Barry audition. I had asked some friends how to get in that camp and I just couldn't figure it out. So whatever. Uh, but like you said, now there's different, I'm sure there's different camps. Um, but on some of the Ricky ones, I would, I remember you go in and it is, you know, it is nerve wracking, uh, but you just stand, you know, you wait until they call you, then you go in, you jam or everybody's sitting in the room together. So you have, you know, 10 other guitar players watching you do your audition. And that's even Ooh, more nerve-wracking. That's stressful. I don't know if I've ever done that. That sounds really stressful. I know for a fact Ricky conducted several of his auditions like that. Anyway, I landed quite a few gigs with, with Ricky even doing that. But, you know, it, it was great preparation. So, once again, be confident, not arrogant. I always say there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance, right? 
That's very good, yeah. You know, be sure of yourself and just do your job. Learn the parts and nail it. And then guess what? Forget about it, right? <laughs> just let it go. And if they call you back, great. If they don't, move on. Yes, I, and I'll, I'll add to that that I do believe, may, maybe naively, but I do believe there's a gig for everyone, at least yeah. here in LA, there's just such a, a plethora of, of gigs and bands and stuff like that. Right. Pre, Pre-COVID, right, we don't know what's going to go on and right, what's right, going right, on right, now, right, right. but but in, in back in normal days, in normal life days, uh, there's just there's so many gigs out there, man. You, you can't let the one thing bum you. It's just like acting. Actors go to Ugh. acting auditions nonstop. What three, four a week? Right. I mean, that's what they're shooting for, and they're probably not getting ninety percent of them. Right. But you got to do what you got to do. You that's know, right. just get up and brush it off and keep going. Yeah. Hey, my name is Sean Hurwitz, and I play for Enrique Iglesias and Smash Mouth, and I am a career musician. Be sure to like, follow, share, and comment on Instagram and Facebook. Binge previous seasons of the Career Musician Podcast and subscribe for all new episodes. Now, I know, again, it's not applicable right now, but talk about your touring rig and, uh, you know, both from a a personal packing peripherals and all that and also your your gear. Because for me, it was always travel as light as I possibly could because it's just easier. (laughs) But uh, Fair enough. Um, Talk about your routine and your, you know, your protocols for packing. Hmm. Um, I guess should we just start from right now, or should we talk about touring the world with Enrique? Uh, when uh, you know a few years ago, or, I think I when mean, you tour the world, it was kind of cool because you had your your guitar uh, tech, you had a big rig, right? Yeah. Well, well, no, actually, uh, in the Enrique camp, when I started, it was an HD five hundred Line Six, and then at a certain point, we were going on a few tours, a few uh, North American tours, like big tours, like a hundred people on the tour. Wow. And um, and I, I flipped them to fractals. I love fractal. Nice. I love uh, Axe Effects. I love Kempers. I'm looking at mine right now. Yeah. Um, I love them. The Kemper, though, sort of what you were going for, it was two pieces, whereas the fractal, I could get an AX8 and it was one piece. So mm. I hit fractal up and they hooked us up and we bought a bunch of stuff and put everything together. So with Enrique, yes, uh, the production took everything with them. I traveled with my bag and one guitar. I always wanted to have my main guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, same thing with Smash Mouth, except my tech is coming from somewhere else and I want to have my stuff in the studio. If you can see that. Right. You know, it's my it's my old um, it's my old uh, rig. Board, Rick, yeah. Uh, yeah, old pedal board. And uh, so I like to have the stuff available when I have gigs in town. So um, I take the stuff with me. And so with Enrique, really, I had one guitar on my shoulder. Um, that one, this bl- this teal one, nice. Blue one. Uh, oh, wh- and who makes that? That's the- so. This is a Shabbat guitar. Shabbat. I'll show yes. you one second. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So it's a Strat style. Uh, it's called the Lynx. Um, for those of you who wonder, I don't know. Can you see this well? This is how I see. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, that looks good. Th- these are these are glow in the dark because oh, so many giant. times yeah. they're giant and glow in the dark because many times I'll find myself in the darkness playing for thirty seconds solo by myself before everyone even comes in. So I can't be screwing that up in front of eighty thousand people. <laughs> Heck no! I never even thought of that. You know how many times I almost screwed up in front of thirty thousand people because I, yep. I didn't have glow in the dark fret dots. That's a great idea, dude. My uh, my, my first tech with Enrique uh, did that, and I was like, "This is awesome." Yeah. So now my guitars with Smash Mouth Shabbat guitars as well, uh, only the Telly style, the Lion. Um, they have the same thing. Yeah, if you can see that. That's really these giant. And they're great. Yeah. The yeah, they're dark. giant. Yeah. You can't miss them, and in the dark, you just you see everything. Um, That's a but great the rig. Tip. Yeah, it, it's it's really good. Um, the so Fractal AX8 was my main rig with Enrique, and um, with Smash Mouth, I was working with this pedal board for a while, which is full of um, analog. Uh, actually, we we shot. Right. A pedal board that you might put. So yeah. we shot uh, something together with a pedal board, and I believe it was this pedal board or something like it. I think yeah. it was this one. Uh, but since then, since I came back a year ago, a year and a half ago now, I think, yeah, I um, 
I moved over to Fractal. I got an AX Ed for Smash Mouth, and now I use that with Smash Mouth. It just seemed uh, simpler. I use Sennheiser uh, Wireless with Smash Mouth. With Enrique, I use whatever they gave me, so that was a Shure Wireless. And uh, I use um, with Enrique. I was using the Shabbat uh, for um, uh, electric. I use Mate and guitars for steel string. I'm looking at it. That's why I'm pointing there. Right. And uh, Merida guitars. Uh, uh, for the the nylon for the nylon for the nylon stuff. I yeah. forgot about tuned. that. I hooked you up with that Mike from Merida. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, he doesn't own the company anymore, but we're still in touch. I should uh, hit him up. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. It's uh, been a while. Mike Spermuli. Yeah. Yeah. Good exactly. People. Good people. And then with with Smash Mouth, I just have uh, two uh, Shabbat Lions, which are the Tully style. Uh, one is an E. One is an E flat. It's basically it as far as gear goes. I love uh, that. I love. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you were asking about uh, packing, and right. but we could talk about that in a second. You were saying yeah. you love that? Well, with rock bands, a lot of times you have to have different tunings. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, Again, I, I spent 12 years on the road with Babyface, so it's R&B music. I had you know five guitars all in the same tuning. Uh, right. Five guitars was overkill, in fact. I, ne- I never needed that many, but we like to have spares. I'd have two or three electrics and two or three acoustics. Um but I've talked to other people. Uh, I can't remember his name, but the guitar, the guitar player I used to know from, uh, oh, jeez, another big rock band who I can't think of. Anyway, he had like 10 guitars all in different tunings. I think that's so I mean, cool. Yeah. You have E flat, you have drop D, you have double drop D, you have G, you know. That's yeah, neat, whatever, right? whatever it calls for. Yeah. You know what? I'll give you a personal story, uh, which got me, the, not got me, but I, do you know Randy Cook? Yes, the drummer. Okay, Randy is a phenomenal drummer who currently plays with Smash Mouth, who also played with Smash Mouth in 2011. He's the one that said, um, uh, guys, I'm going to bring this guy in. He's perfect. Don't need, you don't know, need audition or anything. This guy will he'll do the job. That's the best. One, one of the reasons that he was so confident, I remember, and I, I you know, thanking him is never enough because, I mean, he really made my career. Right. Um, but I, I used to play with him in a few different bands uh, that weren't big or anything, just smaller things. But I remember one of them had like three or four different tunings. And I, rem- I, I remember I came to rehearsal and he's like, what's all this? I had like five guitars with me. And I said, uh, yeah, each one of them is to that tuning. And he was like, he said to me, keep doing that. And you're gonna go. You're gonna go places. Like keep being That's professional. Right. Not like, oh, uh, hang on a second. Just talk. I have to tune my guitar. Like no, you, you're ready to go. There's a guitar for this. There's a guitar for that. There's a guitar for this. You know the songs. Come in, professional. Hit it. And he, I remember that he told me. He told me just keep doing what you're doing. You're gonna. You're gonna go places. I love that. I learned that in Nashville, uh, cutting my teeth in the studio in the studio scene over there. I had to have a bunch of different guitars and all kinds of different stringed guitar-like instruments, and I used to keep them in the in the big coffins that the cartridge company would wheel in. You know, so you open the lids on the coffins, you have all these instruments. When I came out here to LA, that's one of the reasons why. Same thing, I ended up nailing the gig with Babyface because I had my cartridge company at the time, HSR Hollywood Studio Rentals. Chris Johnson, oh. big shout out, Mike Brown, my guitar tech for life. Love you guys. Um, I had them set up my rig in this in the rehearsal studio at Center Staging, mm-hmm. and I had two giant coffins. I probably had thirty instruments. The, gu- the guitar tech at the time walked in. And he's like, "What the hell is this? Oh, this is a funny story. Actually, this pertains to you." He goes, "I had them cart those coffins out because Smash Mouth was just in here, and I thought that was part of their rig." <laughs> And I go, no, man. His name was Gary Williams. I love you, Gary. Rest in peace. He he left us too soon. Uh, and he goes, and, and, and he used to call himself Gary motherfucking Williams. I love you, Gary Williams. <laughs> Best guitar tech in the world. Okay, he goes, he goes, man, I saw all these fucking coffins. I didn't think they were here for baby face. That's an R&B gig. What the fuck you need all this gear for? And then in the same <laughs> sentence, he goes, but as soon as I saw it, I knew whoever the motherfucker was that got the gig was the right guy for the gig. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. Oh, I love That's cool. That. I, I had to do it in Gary's, you know, uh, oh man, I miss you, Memory. Gary. Yeah, anyway. All right. But yeah, that's right. So so again, for, for listeners, be over-prepared. It's okay. You can never be over-prepared, right? 
you can't. Uh, I, I will say I'll I'll add to that one more thing. Be prepared. I learned this from uh, a friend of mine, uh, Yeriv Vaknin, V, uh, Israeli guy. He's one of the first musicians I met here. Super, super talented. Everything. I mean, uh, and I remember he got a gig. He was auditioning. He got this gig. Doesn't matter. Details don't matter. But what he said to me was his w- piece of advice was always prepare for what they want to hear. That's don't. Right. So, so when I went to the Smash Mouth gig, when I went to the Enrique gig, the, the auditions, if you will, are the first time. You know, I didn't audition for either of them. I went and I played in front of 30,000 people or whatever. That's beautiful. That was, the, that was the audition. Welcome. Yeah. You either make it or you don't. That's right. And, uh, and he said, give them your job. And I'll, I, I repeat this constantly. Your job is to give them what they need. Don't do your interpretation of it. This is not the time to be an artist. You're a hired gun. They need you to play X. Come in and play X. Don't play your interpretation of X. Mm. Play X. Play. Do, you don't agree. I, I so agree. I, oh, you so agree. I, I so <laughs> agree. I, the reason why I'm nodding and shaking my head is it's like, wow, I couldn't agree more. Like, yeah. you, We can expound on that. And here's the part I want to highlight. Don't be an artist. If you're called in to be a sideman for a gig you are not the artist don't go in there thinking you're the artist and and doing what's right for you do what's right for the gig yep for the artist that you're supporting i always say that um if you go in and everything is smooth like no one even looks at you because everything is just like perfect like they don't notice any difference you've done the best job you could that that's perfect advice perfect advice okay and actually that's a great way to bring it over to studio etiquette because it's something mm-hmm. i talk about all the time um and you know I, I was just reading an article about leland sklar the famous bass player out here in los angeles it was in the afm magazine um and they were like so what it, what attributes your success and he's like hey man from day one when i was 20 something years old playing for James Taylor and here it is 50 years later I'm still playing for James Taylor I just played what the song needed I played for the song I didn't play to show James oh look at me I'm this really cool bass player you play for the song yep you play for the gig I mean is you can't get any more simple than that right yeah and uh and I'll say something Randy Randy Cook the drummer used to tell me uh, I've never seen him do it, but he used to say that's how sort of how he used to start his clinics. He may still start it that way. He right. starts it with this crazy solo. Maybe it's two minutes, five minutes, whatever. Right. It's just, he's he's an insane drummer. He can do anything. Yes, so he is. He starts it with this amazing solo, and then he says, uh, "I'm paraphrasing." He's basically, "What I just did is not going to get you a gig, right? Ever. Right. Like this is if you can just play for five minutes straight." on time with great feel that'll get you the gig you don't need all of this other stuff it's so true it's so true okay perfect perfect and i would dare say in this culture of mega superhuman chops (laughs) yes sir it's it's a hard concept to understand look i you and me we talked about this in the past we look at youtube or instagram we look at some of these musicians the things they could do are insane yes like, sir. i'm like i look at some of these guitar players i'm like oh my god if i could play like that i think i would have to move to mars because like <laughs> n- my wife couldn't understand me you know what i mean like it's so i do i do out of this world it's it's just another thing it's incredible i love it but it's, it's art it, it, it's an art right it's an art form right. in itself but for what we do it's inapplicable 100 percent agree yeah so I, I think this goes back to another TCM, you know, motto, decide early, make a decision. Are you going to be an artist? You're going to be a side person. I, I that's the video that I talk about. I mentioned earlier, uh, it's basically a hired gun video. I, oh, I love I that. Think, I was looking at it right here. Yes. Yeah. So, so in, there I talk about, you just look, you want to make music m- money for music, but you have to decide, as you just said, do you want to be an artist? Do you want to be, uh, a hired gun right. uh, that goes out on tours or do you want to be a session guitarist and a, or a session musician yeah. and I talk about all the pros and cons about them I actually say if you want to be an artist just turn off the video because just be you that's my biggest piece of advice like listen to people watch the other videos where I'm talking about contracts protect yourself right. uh, do writing like learn that stuff learn the music biz 
Uh, but other than that, dude, just do you. Don't worry about what we have to say. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be a hired gun or if you want to be a session musician, I have a lot to say. And right. And I did. Right. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. And this is the great segue into my next question or topic, business acumen. Um, mm -hmm. You just hinted at it. Look, whether you're going to be an artist, a session musician, or a touring musician, a composer, a producer, or somewhere in between all the above, a teacher, uh, you need to know the foundation of business. Yes. Um, talk about that. Talk about how you learned uh, you know, how did you immerse yourself in that? Because, and when I say this, it, it involves negotiating, branding, learning how to budget, you know, scheduling, reading contracts, all these things. Look, I, I'm I'm constantly learning more and more. Um, but I read a lot of books mm -hmm. about it, uh, books about negotiating, books about dealing with assholes, books about <laughs> uh, making friends, books about uh, networking. Right. Books about the business of music, the lic licensing, publishing, um, writing, owning a master, understanding that whole thing. You know, so I read a lot and I also made a lot of mistakes and learned from them. And as well as, as we said before, uh, learn from other people's mistakes and their success stories. Right, um, right. That, that's the basic of it. So I did a lot of reading and a lot of asking questions. And like you said, it's a never-ending a journey Never i'm on the same path i've been on the same the same mindset read a lot listen to a lot of different podcasts and and yeah. different videos on youtube of people you know discussing business and, and whatnot um another side of the business that i want to bring up is diversification a lot of people think well if i'm not doing music a hundred percent of the time, you know, then I'm not really a real musician. I'm not doing it for, you know, I'm not a career musician or a pro musician. If I, and that's not true. And I, I want, I want to let people know that, you know, it's okay. I only had very few, what I call real jobs in my life. <laughs> you know, uh, I can count them on one hand and it's less than five fingers, but I still did them. And when I did those handful, less than a handful of jobs, I did it wholeheartedly when I was there, and then when I went home, I focused on music wholeheartedly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so my point is you can diversify. So if you think, oh, I'm going to quit my job, I'm going to go home, I'm going to you know, get my mega rig together, and I'm going to be a super producer within like three months. Eh, you might want to think that's, that plan over, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a hefty goal, man. I mean, more, pa more, power, more power to you and good luck. I I'm not going to say no, but... right. But my point is, you don't, whatever you're doing to earn income right now, you don't have to quit. You know, just, just right. hold, hold your horses there. You know, really think about this and plan it out. The reason why I bring it up with you, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. The reason why you bring it up with me? Well, because I do know a little bit about you and your business ventures, and I know you love real estate, as I do. We've talked about it. Um, and I think that's something that's, you know, really important. It is. Uh, I will. What, what I was going to say was just to give an, people an idea. When I left Guitar Center to be a career musician, I told you I can't stop using the, those two <laughs> words together. Um, it was at the time I was working with seven bands. So it wasn't I, I wasn't like committing to the one band. And if I play with anyone else, mm. uh, no, no, no. It's not just diversification, diversification in life. It's also diversification with the people you play with. That's right. Because if this band stops working or they're not working for a few months, what am I? Shit out of luck? No. Right. I've got other projects going on. So you always kind of have to balance that stuff and don't leave your job just because even if your band got signed and you got $5,000 advance, it's like, that's not – think this through for a second. Right. Just think it through. <laughs> you know, it's not like, I'm a rock star. We can leave work and never fuck all you guys. <laughs> right. no, it's not like that. In life, you kind of just, – just pay your dues and get there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, real estate. I mean, right now, I'm a real estate investor. I'm a YouTuber, you know, beginning YouTuber, exploring that whole thing. Right. But but as, as a career, as, as an income, you know, I mean, I'm not just like – playing around with it i'm looking at it professionally um i'm still i'm doing sessions for people i'm in in the licensing world which means i do music for uh well your your listeners know this but licensing in general is just making music for tv and film and and commercials and gaming and stuff like that so i'm constantly balancing and that's not including anything in my regular life that's just stuff that i do for business 
And I'm always looking for more. We had a conversation right before we started recording about like how we want to start working together on some other idea. Right. Diversification, investing in um, all kinds of different things, whether they're real estate or fake estate, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, what, what is royalties? Uh, um, intellectual, intellectual properties. properties. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, these are all important things to look into and get into. And uh, you don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. I really recommend you don't. I think the people that are feeling it right now during COVID the most are the people that put all their eggs in one basket. And then the basket is not there and they're just like, well, <laughs> I don't know what to do now. But, you know, you're surviving. I'm surviving. Some of us are even thriving um, because we have a bunch of different things going on. So that's okay. Right now I'm not working that much, but I have two houses in Missouri. And, you know, I, I've got... I've got things happening. Right. It's it, we're just about to. I don't know if you, I think are you BMI or ASCAP? BMI. I switched about BMI. ten years ago. Yeah. Ah, I switched too. <laughs> so um, so I'm BMI. So we're both in a few. I don't know with Nissel Air, but in in about a week we get a week week and a half we get a royalty check and maybe a little maybe a lot we don't know. That's the yeah. <laughs> beauty of That's that. That's the fun part of royalties, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like, Woo. but uh, but yeah. yeah, this is money that I know will come in. It might not be my full like. I had to cancel. The ca tours were canceled. Like That's we were right. supposed to be on on the road for a while in Australia and New Zealand, ah. and uh, we weren't, and it got canceled, and I lost a lot of money. But it's okay because I have a lot of eggs in different baskets. A so diversified income important. stream. Yes. Yep. Yes. Well, that's perfect because that ties in. I was going to ask you your principles and methods. And what does a career musician mean to you? And you just answered it. So it, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even think I have anything to add. I no. think we've covered. If you listen that's to everything until, until now, those are my methods. Right. No, that's, <laughs> that's in depth. That's perfect. All right. So I love that. Moving on. Memorable moments. Most ridiculous, most fun, silly things that's happened to you on a gig. It could be one thing. Uh, again, now, keeping in mind, folks, he's playing in front of thirty to 80,000 people a night while on tour. I, I think, let me see real quick. Uh, so there is this, th this is my most memorable moment. It's screwing up in front of 5,000 people in Monaco with uh, with Enrique Gates. That's it was my audition show. Never met the dude. This okay. is my first show. And there was a part in, there's a, many parts where the lead guitarist, that would have been, that, that was me at the time, um, takes solo parts where I'm just playing by myself or just me with keys but there's this one part this one part where the dude did sorry I'm playing all weird yeah, I'm, cool, not, I'm, cool. not, I'm not a classical no, guitarist that sounds but, good. but um, it's uh, and it's fast and it's it's just spotlight on you is a and it's just you right and I screwed that up so bad dude <laughs> <laughs> there is video what happened seen, what did you do <laughs> dude i just it's one of those things where i was just i, I mean i just screwed up i could i couldn't get the yeah. it, it didn't happen nothing happened i mean the show went on i right. just made a big smile and played my part and the show went on no one knew right. except for the hardcore fans i was just like oh, that sounds weird but um <laughs> but yeah, you still dude. got the gig you still kept the gig absolutely i mean yeah. I, I i yeah i got the gig i i still kept the gig that, that that wasn't a breaking point but it's and it's not one of my favorite points but it's one i remember let me tell you <laughs> that is awesome that and is you awesome. know i think about that often when i see um when I see people audition, um, my friends right now are on uh, AGT, mm. uh, and um, I I know when you're auditioning, it's nerve wracking because you'll know there's that one part like you got this song down cold, but there's that one part that's just you've practiced this three hundred times in the last two days. Right. Oh, I, I just hope <laughs> I get this right, and I that was the part, and I screwed it up. <laughs> But I only screwed it up one time. That was it. Never again. That's funny. Now, you know and it I, happens. Yeah, it does. And you know what I've done in, in some of those instances is I improvise and do my own thing. So if there was something really important that the musician before me did, I would be like, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to interpret it my, my own way. Because then I know it's a little safer because now I'm playing according to my own skill set and vernacular, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And, but, but it's a good point on what we were talking about before. It's very important to know if that's applicable right. to the gig. 
Right. It might be a very specific thing that the artist wants to hear. As soon as he hears something else, he's like, what's that? Yeah. I didn't. I didn't approve of that. Or he may be like, yeah, that's what I'm fucking talking yeah. about. <laughs> you, you need to know what you're walking into. Do the research and, and, and know if you're walking into something where there's just like, yeah, do you. Or don't even think about it, man. You play that exact lick. That's right. You got to right. know. You got to know what you're walking into. Ah, it's perfect. It's perfect. Sean, this has been great, man. Before we go, I want to wrap with some quick questions just for Hit fun. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think. Favorite food? Uh, pizza. Favorite libation? Adult beverage, if you will. Uh, I don't drink, but Coca-Cola. Mind you, I don't <laughs> drink Coke and I don't eat pizza other than once a month. But those are my favorites. Uh, <laughs> uh, we have the same trainer, so I love busting Sean's chops about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> MSG, we miss you, dude. <laughs> hey, well, he's still got to work on his certificate. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. <laughs> Favorite sport, speaking of training? I'm not a sports guy at all, so I don't have one. I'm the same. That's okay. <laughs> How do you spend your free time, assuming you have any? I mean, you know. Uh, with my wife. Uh, whatever she wants to do, I'm happy with it. Let's do it. Drive or be driven? Uh, drive. It's funny because when I would go on tour for a long stint, you're being driven everywhere. And then you get yeah. back home and I mean, it's just like, yeah, oh, right. Oh, I'm driving. I, I, I didn't forget. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. What activities do you enjoy on those long flights? Uh, podcasts and, uh, yeah, podcasts and something that I don't do often, sleep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What's the last song, band, or artist you listened to that you didn't have any involvement with? You didn't work on it at all. Just something that you uh, listen to for fun. I mean, on the way I was driving around today, and I was listening to uh, Keith Keith Urban's last album. I'm a big fan of his. So there you go. Uh, uh, last album, last single. Man, that dude can write, sing, and play his ass off, right? And don't forget Crazy. that he looks like uh, a model. He looks like dude. a freaking I mean, model, the bastard. <laughs> unbelievable. And, and I hear he's nice. It's like he's come a nice on. guy too, right? Oh, Can't you geez. just be an asshole or something? <laughs> and there, then he's married to a celebrity megastar. You know, beautiful, of actress, probably like, uh, beautiful yeah. kids and everything. Ay, ay, ay. Some guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favorite TV show or movie that you've been streaming? Um. I don't usually, but I was just watching, because I don't have time for it, but I was watching this show on Netflix called Biohackers. Hmm. Um, I just I usually turn on TV to zone out, so that was one right. of those. But uh, I usually watch whatever she's watching, and she's watching uh, True Blood all of the seasons right now. So. Oh, there you go. I like that. I yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, what are you reading? Anything? Yes. Uh it's funny you should mention that. Uh, I forget what it's called. The, the Craving Cure. Ah, is that it's a about with nutrition? it's about yes, it's about carbs and uh, avoiding carbs and sugar, and that is something that's very hard for me. I work at it all the time. I'm sure you do as well. Um, I used to work at it religiously. <laughs> when quarantine hit, I lost a lot of my my uh, I get it. willpower. I'm I'm coming back to working on it because I've been working out this whole time, but yeah. No, oh, I know I've seen. Uh, well, well, the new thank you, but the nutrition, man. It's uh, you and I talk about this all the time. It's it's such yeah. a hurdle. It seems like it's everything, and it's also the hardest thing. Yeah. But that's one of the things that this. So my wife bought it. My wife Trish bought this book for me, and uh, um, it's basically the whole concept of it is, it's not your fault. In nine, the nineteen seventies. The, the 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 scientists started a, a just basically a food pandemic. They've put so much addictive stuff in our food. That's their job. Their job is to get you addicted. And the the stuff that we're putting in our body, our body doesn't even recognize. So it, it, our body keeps telling us that it's hungry because it doesn't recognize that we're feeding it because it's such chemicals and not ah. real food. So the point is. It tells, it explains that to you so you can feel better about yourself and don't feel like a failure. And then it tells you how to get out of it. And it gives you, it's a very thick book and I'm looking forward to reading all of it. Okay. So we're, we're done. We're going to hit the pizza shop with some Coca Cola's <laughs> and kettle chips and, uh, just because I haven't read the book completely. <laughs> oh my God. We, we had, uh, I came back from a camping trip on Monday, uh, the other day and, uh, I was like, 
Trish let me go out with a with, for for the weekend with a yeah. friend and um, to the mountains, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna. I, I said, whatever you want to eat, let's do it. So we had um, what is it called? Uh, uh, cheesecake factory and got a big slice of ah. cheesecake and uh, yeah you got to let it go sometimes this right? was after the camping trip you mean yes i would yes. say because if you're camping you can't go to cheesecake factory no 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 this was after <laughs> i got awesome. back after i basically ate like a, a some beef jerky and then one meal a day for a couple of three days or so so wow that's pretty cool that's pretty cool mm -hmm. all right uh shopping online or brick and mortar I'm a big fan of supporting brick and mortar. However, that's very difficult right now. Right. So online has become a necessity. Right. You've worked with a lot of big names. Any dream collaborations? Foo Fighters, man. Ooh, Foo Fighters. Good yeah. One. I just uh, I've I, everyone knows this about me. I'm dying to play with them. That's awesome. It's funny because Chris Schifflet, uh, the guitarist whose position I would love to have is uh is related to me through marriage i actually spoke to him a few times when i got to la i found out through some really distant family they're like oh we know a musician another musician in the family i was like oh he plays with the foo, foo, foo fighters i was like you, you don't say <laughs> anyway so oh, i spoke awesome. to him a few times but never met him in person one day uh yeah you'll connect you'll connect um okay and finally I think I know the answer because you kind of divulged it earlier. But what would you do if you weren't a career musician? Yeah, um, I'd be a stripper. No, no, I, I, I always you magic know, I was Sean. <laughs> magic Sean. Instead yeah, of Magic right? Mike. <laughs> we're, we're always talking about this. Do you have the 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 what it takes to work out twelve hours a day? Um, no, I would be a firefighter. I would do my best to be a okay. firefighter. I and it, I don't even know why, bro. It's like Sean was just the name that I chose. It just felt right, and I sort of always knew that when I planned I was going to go to America one day. I just felt like Sean would be a good name. I don't know why. And uh, same thing with firefighting. I just feel like I don't. I don't for whatever reason. I feel like I belong there. Maybe I should have been a firefighter instead of a musician. Well, I thought it was extremely peculiar, peculiar that you said, yeah, you know, forget this whole music thing. I'm going to go be a firefighter. And you said that within the first five minutes of the yeah. interview. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if he's just, uh, you know, just riffing or if he actually meant it. So that's really no, interesting. No, I meant it. I meant it. And I don't, and I, again, I have no idea why. It just feels right. <laughs> that's all that's, I can say that's very cool man hey some things you just innately know Sean this yeah. has been a blast and a long time coming yeah thanks for having me man want to learn more about a particular topic tag at the career musician and use hashtag career musician to let us know what you'd like to hear be sure to subscribe to the career musician podcast and like the career musician on all social platforms to stay up to date on news and topics that affect your music career i'm just a nomad nowhere man writing the songs in this one man band I know man, yeah. I'm no man, yeah. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. So hush now, darling, you. Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at PantheonPodcast.com for more info.